All right, you're very welcome along to another RTE Rugby podcast. Tons to get through as we wrap up the pool stages of the Heineken Champions Cup. URC back this weekend and turn our attention towards the Six Nations next week. Bernard Jackman is with me at always and delighted as well to be joined by Johnny Holland, head coach of Cork Con, who are absolutely flying it at the moment. Beat Clontarf for the weekend up to, to third in the table. Johnny, I thought this was meant to be a, a season of transition down in Cork. I don't like transition. Transition is disrespectful to your other players, isn't it? Um, no, transition shouldn't happen. I think if your uh, if your if your club is run well, I think which we tend to be, I think transition can be. Yeah, you you can have change, but I don't think it should be considered a transition that other people think. But yeah, up to up to second, I think are we? Uh, second, you're, you're right. Actually, yeah. No, I did check that beforehand. Yeah, up to second. No, it's a good results, but like again, it's an isolation. It's one result you can't really go up to Dublin and and beat Clontarf and then throw away points elsewhere, like, you know, so we'll uh, we'll try and stay grounded anyway. It was a good, a good game and we, we needed that result as well, like, but um, just a long way to go in there. This is this is what Cork people consider transition to be, Birch. Yeah, it's, it's a bad second in the league in a competitive league. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's, it's, look, a turn year obviously have been um, the standard bears, but we've seen over the last number of years when it comes to um, playoff rugby, anything can happen. So it's good to see Con. Um, back back up there uh, and being strong given the fact that they were supposedly um, you know rebuilding but they're obviously doing a hell of a good job of doing that back up there after only finishing inside the top four last season <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh, we haven't been in second in a while I'd say we haven't been in that home semi-final spot for a while but you know that can be short lived as well if we get ahead of ourselves but um, yeah I think turn your Odds on favourites. We let them run away. They've they've planned Arf again uh, this weekend, don't they? So yeah. that'll be an interesting one. You'll be there, ready and waiting in the long grass. But listen, we'll get right into it now. Um, I might just kind of start, <clears throat> broadly speaking, ar- around the Champions Cup and the the last sixteen ties and potential paths through the tournament that we're seeing, fellas. So obviously, the big one from an Irish point of view, Leinster against Ulster. But it's it's funny, Birch, the way the the kind of map towards a potential final has worked out where if Leinster get through Ulster, potentially they could have Leicester Tigers, Toulouse and La Rochelle in a final just like 12 months ago. It's a, it's a final narrative, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, um, it's funny how things work out, but I suppose from Leinster's point of view, when they saw the V, you know, the, the final was in, in Dublin and, and the new, um, the new way of, of laying out the competition where you can actually, control your own destiny. Um it was pretty clear they were gung ho about getting maximum points in the in the group stages and have now, I suppose, taken a bit of control of, of their own destiny. And you think back to the last couple of years, okay, they lost the loss of Saracens and behind closed doors in the Aviva. Um uh, and you know definitely the lack of atmosphere there that they, you know, certainly wouldn't have wouldn't have helped them. It wasn't um a usual home game, but then to lose to La Rochelle in the semi final, to lose in Marseille um, this is really it, it, it's perfectly set up for them but also it ranks up the pressure as well uh, it cranks up the pressure because if they weren't to finish it this year you'd have serious um, question marks around their ability to get it done you know uh, in, the, in the latter stages yeah and Johnny like the, the fact that it ramps up the pressure that's the crucial part of it because we have found it interesting in the our little media pack just from covering Leinster press conferences over the last year, 18 months, you know, Leo Cullen, he's, he's constantly spoken, particularly around the Champions Cup last season, of like the importance of being able to get the home advantage, controlling your own destiny and being able to stay at home, having your your home support, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, he highlighted that the the game against Montpellier being called off last year. He's spoken a lot about that over the last 12, 13 months, about how, difficult that made it for them having to to go on the road to Leicester in the quarterfinals last season and we brought up with him just before the game last week about you know if you get your win you get your bonus point win you're guaranteed to be in Dublin come what may regardless of what stage of the competition you you exit at and all of a sudden Leo Cullen has flipped it around and home advantage apparently doesn't mean too much in rugby you know it's it's actually not really the be all and end all I know what he's doing. And like, obviously we all know what he's doing. He's trying to just kind of play it down, but it is funny, the psychology where you get the feeling it very much is on their minds that the, the light is being shone on them to, to be the favorites the whole way through this competition. Yeah, they are the favorites. So I, I think like, you know, they're the favorites until they come up in that, 
in that kind of big power game against the La Rochelles of the world. Like they will be favourites until then. And even at that, you know, you'll talk about revenge and you'll talk about this and that, and you'll probably make them favourites anyway. And they're at home now as well. So, uh, you know, I think they put the pressure on themselves anyway. I think there's a massive focus within that group of what they haven't done in the last couple of years, despite everyone saying what they have done. Like there's no point in playing all this lovely rugby like that. Was it a six man uh, with a bit of variation that they went through? Uh, Gary Ringrose and the last pass to Jimmy O'Brien, wasn't it? So, you know, I think they have the ability to pull those things out. Um, but like, you know, they put the pressure on themselves to play that style of rugby and to to play the brand of rugby that they do play. But again, it's at, at the end of the competition where they have to get very effective against the scrum and the mall and the big power pack. You know, that's where the question marks are going to come up probably here and for the rest of the year. Like, are they are they able to do it? And um, you know, they're they're missing one or two players out of that pack at the moment that will give them the the last bit of firepower to hopefully. For them, um, you know, flip that script a small bit and, and really put it away. But like Leinster and Dublin are, they are a different animal. Leo Cullen can say what he wants, but they're a different animal in Dublin. It's very, very hard to break them there. They've got a phenomenal record. Like it's, you can't really see it going any other way, especially when they've actually got a chip on their shoulder now in terms of the, the Champions Cup. Like Leinster don't generally do chip on their shoulder, not outwardly at least, but I think they're all making it fairly vocal that this is the one they're really after. Like it's not going to be successful just win another league at this stage, you know. Yeah, and when they do chip on their shoulder, they do it fairly well. Before we kind of speak about Ulster's chances against Leinster, we might do that a bit later on, but Ulster getting through, which is absolutely fantastic for them, but themselves in Montpellier, both qualifying for the last 16 with with one win out of four. We know Connacht did it last season as well. It, it's just, virtually, it is one of those things that a lot of people have kind of found a bit objectionable, the fact that, you know, winning a quarter of your games in a pool stage, you get through to, to a last 16, and it's it's just one of the issues I suppose people are having with the the tournament and the way it's laid out at the moment. Yeah, look, it's 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 not the same um, tournament that uh, we we all love at the moment in, in its current format. You know, it's it's nearly harder not to make top sixteen than make it. Um, there's been you could certainly question some of the um, interest, well, some of the selections. Um, you know, Gloucester coming to the to the RDS. Um is, is an obvious example. Um the quality, you know, there's probably it's 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 much more narrow the, the teams that can genuinely win it. Um but I think now it will start to get exciting, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh but uh but from a from a governing body point of view, you would imagine the EPCR will, will have to do a review of um of how it's set up and it's not gonna be easy because you have a lot of moving parts and even more complicated now with the South Africans involved. Um, this season and beyond, but it, it, yeah, it, it's been slow to um to really come to hand, and hopefully after this, we'll have a good Six Nations, and then we'll we'll get into obviously the the better teams. Uh, everyone hopefully having a, a real interest in it, and um we get some you know great rugby played and 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 a worthy winner. Yeah, and then finally on the just the the general ta- Champions Cup knockout stage is Johnny Munster. Great that they've managed to get through and everything like that as well. And it's going to be sharks away. And it's setting up what could be a, a brutal four weeks for them where they're over in Durban. If they win that, they would either be away to Toulouse or home against the Bulls. And they'd follow that up, getting back on a plane to go back to South Africa for two more weeks. You would nearly actually say having the week off, like losing against the Sharks initially and having a week off between those two blocks mightn't be the worst thing in the world. Yeah, it's rough, like isn't it? And I think they're up against it. But if you look at what they did at the beginning, I think their their season is really turning now. I think we were talking about oh, a win and their season will turn. Oh, they need another win and their season will turn. But that was a huge game at the weekend. You know, you can you can argue that to lose an eleven nil up and then probably sat back as well. But that's not really eleven nil isn't a lead that you sit back on. You know, so I do think they they shocked everyone with the turnaround, the physicality, that the you know the try that they scored. Um, they they played really good rugby and they really stood up to the test of Toulouse. So I don't think they're going to go to Durban and think they can't win. You know, and this is Munster in a Champions Cup, albeit in a very different uh, atmosphere in Durban. You know, they haven't done that one before in a Champions Cup, so it's not the same as uh, style miracle match as before. But uh, I think they're the confidence within that group is high. You know, and what they're actually achieving. Um, having Joey Carberry back, unfortunately for him, that will give them a little bit of a um an extra edge as well in the Six Nations period. So. They can they can actually continue driving their game with the better who's probably going to be driving it, you know. Um mm-hmm. but like yeah, it's 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 uh 
you can't really see them coming out the other end of, of that four game block in, in too good a shape. You know, the other thing is when you go away from home and you're traveling and everyone's together, that can sometimes give you something. I know being at home is nicer, but like everyone together, getting on the same page, a bit of camaraderie there. Um, it can it can give you some form of an edge, but it's going to be massively difficult. And just on the competition structure, I think like you know I don't like it, I, I, and I don't. I think at the end of it, you know, a team that's only won one out of four going through the pool stages, they're not going to want to win it anyway. So they can sneak through if they want to. I don't think you're going to just pick up the form to win the Champions Cup, so you're going to get knocked out at some stage. But I I don't like the fact that Munster could possibly go back away to Toulouse. I know it's a draw, but back away to Toulouse after having a mammoth game away to Toulouse, I think it's just you know the. Uh, the the bite of that game will it be there? I'm not really sure. It's a hard thing to get your mind back around, isn't it? Yeah, be a tough one. Before any monster fans jump me, I I definitely was joking when I just said that you know it might be better for them to to lose that last sixteen game against the Sharks. On the the matches specifically, Bert, she'll start on Leinster, thirty six ten winners against Racing ninety two. One of the strangest games I've ever been at, where they were what twelve ten ahead, uh, heading into the final fifteen minutes and managed to pull four tries out of the bag. But is is that down to the fact that they played at such a huge pace for those first 20 minutes when they had a lot of possession and they were clearly trying to wear down a, a big, heavy Racing 92 pack and as much as they struggled their way through large parts of it, is that four tries in 15 minutes right at the very end? Is that the payoff for the way they approached the game initially? Yeah, I think it is. And they were more accurate the, the longer the game went on. Like they did start at a high pace, but some uncharacteristic handling errors, um, some breakdown issues, just getting... And at first, both, I think, were down to Rassi's defence being far more aggressive um, and well-organised than it was in La Harve. Uh, but Leinster didn't get the scores on the board that they normally uh, would uh, have expected with all that possession. Um, but yeah, they didn't, didn't flinch, you know. There was opportunities when you think... You know, things that it's our day, maybe let's just win this game and, and uh forego the opportunity of a bonus point or get get a two score lead first and then go for the bonus point. They turned down the shots at goal, went to the corner. And at the end, you know, Racing I was pitch side. I mean, it was obvious for the last fifteen minutes how fatigued Racing were and <clears throat> Leinster are incredibly fit. And I know it's something that Stuart Lancaster believes will be a, an easy win for him in Racing is get him fitter. You know, um, and uh, I think one of his key appointments is 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 his head of S and C. But um, they weren't fit enough to be fair to them. They deserve credit because they came, um, and actually made it a contest and, and mm. tried to win the game. Uh, so I I I don't. They obviously were hurting after their, you know, poor very poor performance again in the Harv, um, and obviously had a chance of qualifying, um, but. No, they just they were just punched drunk at the end. Um, and Leinster actually, ironically, got better, more accurate with fatigue. Um, and you know, put them, put them away. And and if you just looked at the result, it hadn't been there. You would have thought oh, it was a one sided affair, but it wasn't. Um, but Racing exposed areas of potential weakness for Leinster that we don't see every week. You know, for a team that's unbeaten, um, and they are very very strong in in nearly all areas. But over the last month. Without far long, without Jenkins, <clears throat> excuse me. There's been little signs of of worry. You know, uh, the scrum, the scrum for sure. We saw it in the Ospreys, and in fairness, the Ospreys they have a a very good set piece, but they're not, you know, top mm. of the range European uh, royalty at the moment. But that's uh, but the scrum has been on and off all season, even going back even before Christmas, I would say. Yeah, no, it has it has um, inconsistent. Uh, and that's an area that look. We remember if you met, I spoke about a Saracens game. Effectively, that game turned on Saracens doing a real number on Leinster. Look, Leinster will have tight for long with a bit of luck to come back in. They may decide to put Jason Jenkins in there, um, when he comes back from injury. But that's not like you could have two injuries in a in a semi final. You could have both men out. Um, so they're going to have to concentrate on fixing that. Um, and then obviously their mall D over the last two weeks has been exposed, you know, uh, Gloucester, again, who aren't a mammoth pack, you know, but very well drilled in that area, got two penalty tries and then Rassing, um, got some inroads in that. So it's not perfect, but to be fair, like, you know, you, you'd love to be Leo Cullen as opposed to any other coach. Um, you know, the two things that they should be able to fix and the rest of their game is, is very strong. 
But Johnny, they, they're two very, very important things that need to be fixed. Also, just from an Ireland context where you have, you know, the bulk of that Leinster pack are the Ireland pack, essentially. And, you know, you really want to be on top of them day to day rather than trying to, to fix those things when players are coming into camp. Now, I know they're not playing identical systems or, you know, identical, you know, ways of scrummaging or the, the, the way they're defending at, at, at lineouts and malls. But you kind of, would you, would you be concerned with with the way they, th- those elements of the game are going for Leinster, just from a broader Ireland point of view as well? Yeah, I think in one sense you are, but like, you know, like Bernard said, you could bring a couple of other fellas in there um, and you'd like to be concerned about those things while you're winning very well, you know. So I think they, I, th- I think they've gotten a bit of a warning sign while they're still winning and that's the best time to get that warning sign, isn't it? If they can p- fix these things while they're already winning, then I think they're going to be in a great place. It's better than... You know, getting these warning signs now is better than getting them in late March. And then you can't really, you don't have time to turn that momentum around. But yeah, like, it's funny when you're coaching, you know, you like, you like to think that everyone in the group, you know, Al Alatoma is not a poor prof. Uh, Joe McCarthy is not a small second row. He's not dissimilar to Jenkins. But sometimes it's just a thing that the likes of Tyke Furlong might do. It just turns you around. Like, it, uh, Bernard, you might tell me a bit better, but it doesn't seem like Andrew Porter is as dominant on his side when... Ty Furlong's not over on his side, you know, so it actually has an impact on other people as well. Ty Furlong's just such a cornerstone in that scrum. And I think I saw one of the malls at the weekend, I think Joe McCarthy is is a big lump of a man and he's obviously going to go on to better things, but he's popping up in the middle of the mall while they're going a little bit backwards near their own line. I think, that, you know, there's certain bits of connections inside in that mall that just didn't seem right. Um, but again, it, it, like, you know, personnel can can have an impact on that. A little bit of coaching and and uh, getting that cohesion back and have a massive impact on it. And and sometimes when you focus on it going into the latter end of it, maybe that's going to be their major strength that gets them over the line. You know, but like you say, going into the Ireland camp, you know, you're you're not going to get a bigger side going into the Irish camp, but you are going to get a bigger side when you face the other international team. So like, you know, Ty Byrne in the second row isn't going to be a Jason Jenkins, but you do get some very good forwards in the tight like Ty Byrne, like Peter Romani, that kind of offer that extra edge. Um, and and bring a different side to that pack like you know so uh, i wouldn't yeah there's, there's always comparisons when leinster have a, a bit of a weakness and then you you give that same weakness to ireland but it, it, it is slightly different we'll see how um the first game goes against wales with you know a little bit of pressure on as well away from home if i'm gonna talk about a positive someone who has just been lighting it up all season birch gary ringrose uh player of the match again at the weekend uh it was his break for that first try on 15 minutes. Now, I know that it was, it was a proper team effort to, to find that hole. But you think about the, the, the second from last try where he fly hacks that ball and has to make the, the right decision about what to do when he's coming up to it and just manages to scoop it up into the into the hands of Hugo Keenan to score. Then you've got, or it might have been Jimmy O'Brien, and my mind's gone blank, and then also scoring at the end as well. But the fact that he's been doing all of this this season while having taken on the extra burden of of captaincy as well, probably says a lot about him because we've seen some players whose whose performances out on the pitch have kind of suffered when they've initially taken on the role of captain. But if anything, Gary Ringrose looks like he's playing better because of it. Yeah, he's he's um he's very interesting because he's so he's just so consistent um like week in week out eights nines out of ten um and has a real edge to him as well so he has the flair and ability to do extraordinary things but yeah defensive you know defensively at the breakdown he's very clinical um and there's a there's a real edge to the physicality he brings um and has become a, a key man I mean also I suppose you know Leinster missing, you know, Robbie Henshaw, uh, and you know he's been able to build a relationship with Nat I or or Jamie Osborne, um, and not affect you know his ability to to be a star performer. Um, he probably went to the Irish camp against Wales and and, and probably partner up with with Bundy. You would imagine, and again, you wouldn't expect there to be any issue. He just seems to just get on with it. Um, and I know he's incredibly highly respected by players who play with him, uh, both in Ireland and. Um and Leinster and um you you you'd say if there was a Lions tour this summer, uh, like he'd have to be very close to being a starting starting thirteen. Um, but as you said, it's that leadership element as well. Part of leadership group in Ireland probably looks like he's going to be you know he's the long term replacement of Sexton and um and certainly in Leinster and, and maybe in Ireland as well as Ireland captain. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see, but he's he's in great form at the moment. So Leinster. They are at home against Cardiff this Saturday. That game is live on RT2 and RT Player. Um, interesting 
this game, the, the last round before the Six Nations 12 months ago, that was Joe McCarthy's debut. Last round before the Six Nations two years ago, Jamie Osborne made his debut. I really want to see the team sheet this weekend and see who's going to be the who's going to be the one you circle this weekend and say in 12 months or in 18 months time that player is going to be absolutely lighting it up so that that's a reason to watch it this weekend but look we'll move on to Munster and Toulouse now Munster tw- beaten 2016 by Toulouse um Johnny as you kind of hinted at earlier on it was a defeat for Munster obviously which is a bit of a blow but it was there were elements of that performance that were really great the fact that it came down from 11 points down and and really like really in the first 20 minutes when it looked like Toulouse were battering them but there was a kind of an interesting dynamic where going into the game Munster's place in the quarter in the last 16 I should say had been sealed uh, regardless of the outcome they were only going to potentially drop one more place by the time it had kicked off actually they couldn't even drop below six so there really was nothing for them to to lose in the game and they could kind of throw the shackles off and see where it took them. And in fairness to them, they really went for it. And look, a couple of things here or there didn't go their way in the afternoon, but they'll probably come away with that game with more positives than negatives. No, I think you should definitely come away with positives from that game. Like they're to lose our European powerhouse at this stage. Like, I mean, they're they've quality all over the pitch, they've got a massive pack. And obviously, Munster soaked up a lot of that early on. They were taking hit after hit losing gain line after gain line and it was not looking pretty, you know, so um, and I think Toulouse probably had a small bit more left in the tank as well at that stage until they realised that Munster were turning it around the small bit but I think the the most promising thing is they kind of stuck to their guns and they they didn't just put the ball up the jumper, they didn't um, you know, they didn't go back into into their shell, they actually came out of it a small bit more and that's I think how they turned the game around, you know the, um, unfortunately Mike Haley went off the knee and that's why Jack Crowley went to 15 and Fekitoa came into 12 um, Mike Haley is a massive loss I think he's been unbelievable like one of the guys that you're thinking how is he going to make a step up to Irish rugby when you know that's definitely the best rugby of his career I don't know how he rides so many tackles takes so much hits and, and keeps going forward but they lost him in fact it all came in um, and that try was just phenomenal Gavin Coombs around the back uh, Gavin Casey or um, Craig Casey with a with a fake kick <laughs> and all the rest of it everything, everything else that was involved in it you know and that that's kind of that sums up how they how they approached it and how they got themselves back into the game that they didn't really um, go back into their shells they absolutely went after them and I think they're very unlucky in the end I think the, the yellow card on, on Ben Healy you know it probably is one like you know there's massive separation with his elbow I think it's hard when it's someone like that who isn't going to go into a contact looking for sharp edges you know he's just protecting himself in the contact if it's a big hard carrying centre you're nearly thinking that they've done it on purpose he just did not do that on purpose but the letter of the law may be fair enough and it just took the wind out of their sails at the end um, but they were they were going to win that like you know it's a uh, I think they'll take it's I hate saying they'll take a lot out of it. Um, you know, again, a morale boosting loss, you know, on one of those, but like they were they were so so close and it's uh very encouraging for them. And that's why I think they've kind of turned it now. You know, there's been some um big calls in selection and fellas have backed that up. I think Calvin Nash and Shane Daly are going really well on the edges as well. So they've got a lot of fellas who are hitting form at the moment and you know, fellas in the pack as well that are, are bringing a bit more of an edge and they'll get players back as well between now and the end of the season. So I don't think they're in a good place, but they prefer to be in a good place while getting a, a, a kind of a corner turning win as well. Yeah. And as like as, as we mentioned, that that second try, Birch, if you were to compare that to some of the stuff we saw back in September, or early October, where they were struggling to put two or three simple passes and phases together. I mean it's it's worlds apart in rugby terms, isn't it? Yeah, look this that's a I suppose um a sign of all the the way they've changed how they train, their philosophy is coming to fruition. Um, because I think, you know, the Munster team of old, the, the great Munster team, you know, were very pack orientated, very strong kicking game, play the percentages, play cup rugby. That's becoming more difficult to, to do um, just because of the way the game is refereed, the way the game is played, the ability to build or have a, have a pack that are completely dominant. Um, you know, there's some very, very strong packs around. So, what Roundtree's done and what Prendergast has done and Leamy's done is they've they've decided, look, we, we're going to have to be a little bit more unpredictable. We're going to have to be able to run at space. Uh, we're going to have to be able to play more unstructured rugby than structured rugby. And, you know, in the first couple of months, there was clear signs of or maybe a lack of skill set or a lack of fitness or a lack of understanding uh, because there is rules within that. It's not just chaos. There, there's, there's principles. Um but now it seems to be they're much more comfortable, and and I I I I totally agree with Johnny. I thought 
you know, the way, there was about, there was one phase of play where they got smashed three times in a row, uh, and you know most teams have a rule. You know, if you lose momentum, you look to to send it back to them and 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 start again. Whereas Munster didn't at all, and Carberry, to be fair, obviously he had his troubles with his pace kicking, but um, I thought Joey, you know, was was instrumental in in wanting the ball and wanting to move the ball at, at pace um, when it wasn't really going well, and eventually you could see Toulouse starting to. Their, their defensive organization started to crack a little bit and Munster put them into a place and a speed of game that they weren't really comfortable with. Um, and obviously that try was uh, was a direct result of that. But I think Munster, I know they would love to have beaten Toulouse either home or away, but both games they finished with, I, I would say, you know, certainly a feeling that they can live with them for sure. And that's that's a massive step forward um, because they're not at, they're not at the level that they will be at. Um, but they've qualified. They could easily go to Sharks and win. It's not. It's not. Sorry, they can go to Sharks and win. It's not going to be easy. But um, you wouldn't write Munster off. I don't think they're genuine, genuine contenders this year. To be honest, to win Europe, but um, you can't help but be impressed about um how things have started to turn in a in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Johnny, I might throw the the Joey Carberry question to you as well after Birch mentioned it. So obviously. There was a huge, huge spotlight on him coming into this weekend. And I know the the two conversions were obviously frustrating and their ones he'll want back. But overall, in terms of his game, how do you think he played? He played like a guy who's going to turn that back around. That selection, I don't think, is uh, written in stone, you know. Um, and I think that that's the that's the best part of what happened at the beginning was that, you know, he had very disappointing news. If that's in a a break where you've got three weeks off and you don't get to play things fester. Whereas he had a huge opportunity as close as you can get to an international scene, I suppose, to to prove himself. And, and that's what you want as a player. You don't want to be waiting to try and get that opportunity again. I think when you're a younger player, the pressure comes on and you're like, oh God, they're all going to see me for what I was and not selected. And they're going to find out reasons why I wasn't. But as you become a bit more mature and like Joey is, he's been through a lot. He's very experienced. He's play, played with the best players. Um, You know, he you want to take that pressure on. You look at it as, as an opportunity as opposed to pressure. And I think that's what he did. You know, Bernard said there, he was very, very calm. He wasn't like a guy that was under pressure. Yes, he'd like to have kicked his four points, but the four point margin, you can't equate that to the losing of the game because the game just goes a different way. You know, to lose of a different mindset or whatever happens. So I wouldn't really worry so much about that side of it. Obviously, he kicks them on another day and I think his goal kick has been quite good. So, you know, I think it, it's very, very encouraging. Um, Brandy Farrell as well, that he's given him feedback and he's gone out and just, He's been very, very mature about how he's how he's kind of continued with his game because I think the biggest thing that everyone said in the last couple of weeks is that he's actually coming off the back of some of his best form in the last couple of months, you know. So he hasn't really flinched like he's just gone straight back into doing that. Now was he taken off at like fifty minutes? I was, I was a bit disappointed with that. I think you know maybe Munster were looking at Ben Healy's kicking ability. He obviously had missed four points from the tee. Um, you know, I'd like to back him a small bit more there because I think he does kick quite well normally. But then you're you're in a a really important game and if you can get a win there obviously you'd like to take three points or you'd like to take a long range effort at some stage but uh, I'd like to have seen him stay on the pitch a little bit longer I think that just adds a small bit to the pressure but I think he uh, he stood up definitely yeah yeah and he'll probably be playing this weekend as well Munster against Benetton away to Benetton on Saturday afternoon as much as he'd like to be in Irish camp but a boost for Munster all the same Elsewhere then, Ulster 22-11 winners against Sale at Kingspan Stadium on Saturday. The result burst that gets them through to the last 16. I know we spoke about the, the merits of having a one-win team in the, the knockout stages of the competition, but all the same for Ulster, just a, a massive result, first of all, to to get into the, the knockout stages of the competition. And in fairness, they've done so courtesy of the bonus points they've picked along the way. But also getting back and getting a victory against Sale after that 39-0 hammering over in Manchester. Yeah, look, they've they've turned a corner, um, which is which is all you can ask of them, really. I mean, the the effect that that second half collapse had in the RDS against Leinster and how that you know led to obviously that huge defeat away to Sale, um, and then you know very poor first half against La Rochelle, but they've got enough bonus points. I don't have an issue with Ulster being in the competition because I think um, if you're just if you had said in in October, late October, early December. You know, our Ulster top sixteen side in Europe, you would you would say they were, you know. Um so they're in there now. And I, I think they'll they'll relish this. This is a better fixture for them than in a way to to lose or or to the Sharks because okay, it's, it, they're the best team in it, but there's that familiarity of, of, of having, you know, played against these fellas since you were uh, a schoolboy or a youth. 
Uh, they've beaten Leinster a couple of times in, in, in recent history. The last time they played them in the Viva in a quarterfinal of Europe, they should have won the game. Um, and there's time for them to get back into form. Leinster have 20 odd players in the Irish squad. Who knows how Leinster would be for that first uh, game back in, in Europe. So, uh, a lot to look forward for Ulster and it's just we want to I want to see all the Irish provinces in, in a in a good state and the and the state they were in three or four weeks ago with that doubt about their their mentality um is, is a horrible place to be. So they they look like they've turned a corner and hopefully you know they, they continue this weekend is big for them, you know, to pack it up before they there's a bit of a break. Um and obviously the stormers coming to Dublin or to Belfast is uh is a real challenge so they can't rest in their laurels yet but there's certainly positive signs yeah and I suppose as we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier on you know Joey Carberry being available for Ulster the the flip side of their poor form is that quite a like a good handful of their players haven't been selected in the Ireland squad and, and as such Dan McFarland is is going to have them available for this game against the Stormers this weekend which is huge for them Johnny because if they if they can come out of this and get a win if you look at where they are in the various tables through to the last 16 of the Champions Cup and still in a, a reasonable position in the in the URC, they'll have they'll have got through this really, really tough block, having gone through some awful form, but still in reasonable shape and have a couple of weeks to to fix a few things and work on a few bits. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think, you know, they've got a couple of what they would consider internationals, even though they're not in the international camp now. You know, Timoney and Treadwell and fellas like that, I think that they can drive on environment around in, in Ulster at the moment and um you know the Stormers are coming over without their their South African contingent aren't they so their international contingent so I think that it's a big opportunity for them to back it up at home but you know Byrne saying there that Ulster will I think they'll really enjoy having a crack off Leinster in the in the Champions Cup and when you think about what Leinster have struggled with it's their scrum in their mall and if you think about the only thing keeping Ulster in games in the last couple of weeks was their scrum in their mall like they won a uh, scrum penalty against La Rochelle that um Doke kicked the knee, so there was that side of the game. I we all know what their attacking mall is like. Although it wasn't as good in the last couple of weeks, but then again, they weren't winning games, like you know. So I think if if they fancy themselves at all, they'll fancy themselves in those areas and trying to test whether Leinster have fixed those cracks because that's where their game is set up around, you know. So they'll they'll be massively looking forward to that and the fact that it's a uh, you know there's a lot of pride in there. Um, Bernard said it. It's it's not like going away to La Rochelle or away to Toulouse or anyone like that. You know, I think there's. There's, there's too much pride on the line. They'll have to find a, a performance from somewhere. But yeah, they do have a lot of time in the meantime. And I think the Stormers game is a is a big opportunity to turn that around. But I think there's just, you know, form hasn't been their friend like James Hume isn't finding form. I don't think Billy Burns is going to be the man to drive them through um, a Champions Cup win or maybe even a league win. I don't think he's the kind of forgotten out half of an Irish rugby at the moment. I don't know if he's really driving the team around the pitch. Um, you know, so not everyone is in the same form as what they were when they were flying it. You know, they're not getting the same go forward from McCluskey, but the cohesion isn't there around them. So, like, you know, they at the same time, if one or two of those players can start turning their form around, then I think it's a perfect time with the Six Nations break. They can get a win this weekend and kind of recoup and get back on the front foot um, with a bit of a rest and and I think a, a mental space as well that, they, that they're that they overly due. I think they're um they're not a million miles away at all. I know they had a, a tough run of form and Spotlight came on and people speaking on Twitter and all the rest of it uh, from within the camp. I don't think it's a great look. But I think they'll they'll always have confidence within their group up there, won't they? And I think it's only a couple of different, couple of small things because a lot of those games were were laid on as well, weren't they? So they they've done enough. Even the Leinster game that they lost, they they, they had a very good performance for the first, you know, 40, 50 minutes or whatever it was, and I think they did some damage up front as well. So they, you know, if they can if they can bring take the emotion out of it, I think they'll they'll go back to the facts of it, and and they were they were quite close back then. There's no reason why they won't be again. Yeah, and we saw last season just how just how good they can be when some of those backs really click, like Mike Lowry and Rob Balakoon, James Hume as well. So still a long way to go in the season, but Ulster against the Stormers Friday night, 7.35 kickoff. That's an RT2 and RT player as well. On Connacht, they've missed out in the, the home draw in the, in the last 16 of the Challenge Cup. They're going to be away to Benetton. But I kind of have to talk about Bundyaki realistically, Birch, uh, out of the squad again at the weekend. That's four games in a row he's missed. Granted, one of those was an official IRFU player management rested game, but the last three he's just been been not selected, been left out of the squad. But we were I was on Connacht Media Call yesterday. I put the question to Andy Friend about, you know, there have been links of Bundyaki potentially going to to Munster to see out the rest of his IRFU central contract. Andy Friend said he has no doubt that 
Bundyaki is going to be at Connacht next season, and he says that uh, talks of a move to Munster are, are just paper talk. What do you what do you think of that? Um, yeah, I'm sure they are paper talk because he's contracted. But the reality is, well, sorry, the perception is, uh, and I think look at I think it's uh, two words you don't want to get confused. No, 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 no. But uh, there's, there's <laughs> definitely there's definitely things aren't uh, hunky dory there um, at the moment between Bundy and Connacht, and it's probably it's probably good timing that he he's gone to the Irish camp, you know, because the longer that goes on, where he's not playing or starting, um, the bigger the 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 rift can become. So I think, I think with Robbie being out, he's going to probably play for Ireland against Wales, and he may go back to Connacht. You know, this time away may may heal whatever, um, frustration is there on both parties, um, sides, and. If they could fix that, then obviously I, I think it would be sad to see Bundy leave Connacht um, because I think um, he's been an unbelievable servant to them. He's been a, at the core of of, of everything um, good has happened there over the last, what, seven, eight years since he came in from the Chiefs. Um, but on the other side of the coin is if for whatever reason he feels or the, or the club feel or the province feel that you know they can't get that relationship back to where it needs to be. I personally would prefer to see him stay in Ireland and be eligible for Ireland than go to France or Japan. And that's the we don't know if that's if that's on the radar. Uh, look at the reality is if if Bundy Aki wants to leave Connacht, um, he will find a very good club. You know, anywhere across the world, wherever he wants to go, he's a, he's a he's a very very good player. So that's not a you know that's not an issue. And and to be honest, that's. That's not the case with every player. There's a lot of players who maybe are unhappy, would love to leave, but don't have viable options, you know. So it doesn't ever come to a head, you know. Um, uh, but Bundy for sure. Also, you know, reality was he came here from Waikato. He's made Connacht his home. He's given a huge amount. Um, maybe he wants to change. I, 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 like these are all area, uh, things that we're not sure about. But there is look, there's definitely an issue there. Um, and likewise, if you don't have to be rocket science to go science to go well. If Bundy was to leave Connacht, what Irish province should be clamouring to get him? And this is a bit of, you know, uh, adding two to do and getting four. But Munster should be after him because he would make them better. He would make them better. And um, if Bundy Aki went to Munster, would Munster be more likely to win a trophy? Yes, you would say they would. Um, are Munster an attractive proposition for Bundy at the moment? Yeah, they are because... Uh, they would be because of the way their their form is and how they're trying to play, etc. So that's probably where it's coming from. But from a Connor point of view, no one is going to say, "Yeah, there's a chance." You know what I mean? It'll happen, and and Buddy won't say it either. But um, these things either get fixed or or, or a solution is found, and that solution, you know, would, would either be he stays in Ireland or he goes away. You know, um, if he doesn't stay in Connor, sorry, he either stays in another province. Or he leaves Ireland, um, and I certainly would prefer if he can't stay in Connacht. I think the, the ideal solution is he stays in Connacht and, and they rebuild that relationship. But the problem as well is, Friendy's leaving, so you know who it doesn't really matter to a certain extent if he, if 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 him and Friendy are the current coaching staff are back on terms. It's who the next coach is, mm-hmm. um, and maybe that's maybe that's at at the source of frustration is that he doesn't know where Connacht's future is, and he's someone who. You know, has used to being successful with Ireland now, and 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 obviously had that success with Connacht years ago under Pat Lamb, but wants to be in the run up for silverware again. So there's lots of lots of different factors that could be at play here. But this happens in soccer all the time. This happens in in rugby in, in as well, but it doesn't really get played out in front of the press. But it does happen. Players move. Um, players move when they're under contract. But it's rare for us to have that situation to us. Yeah, it is. And Johnny, look, I'm sure as a as a Munster man, you would welcome someone like Bundyaki to the province with open arms. But it would be a shame, given the the connection he's had with Connacht down the years, for like if we did potentially have that kind of a bitter divorce. Yeah, like he's a cult hero in Connacht, isn't he? Like I, I think it would be it would be very sad to see him leave. I think they've built a lot of a team around him. I think he's just a different animal. They're a different animal when he's in there. And from a monster perspective, I've come up against him. He's not easy to play against. He's he's very very sore to play against. So he, uh, you know, he's 
he would be a very interesting proposition for Munster, a lot of go forward, which makes your game a lot easier. But he's also a game winner and a game changer. He gets these big turnovers at, at very important times. Um, So like a, a guy that you hate to play against, but a guy you'd love to have in your team, you know. But I think the Andy Friend thing in the press yesterday was very much um external pressure, wasn't it? I think it was uh, maybe his parting gift that he can keep Bundyaki and Connacht and keep people happy because when you take him out of the team, they don't look like the same kind of um, heavy hitters, do they? They're, they're kind of lacking punch without him. So maybe Andy Friend is trying to put that pressure on from the outside. Maybe he's trying to calm it down as well from the outside. I'm not really sure, but it didn't seem like it was, I didn't believe it. <laughs> you know, So when he said that, you know, he will be in Connacht, I didn't believe that for a second. I think it's still ongoing. If he was still going to be in Connacht, I think they would have sorted their differences, which is, if there are differences, but it doesn't seem like they have, you know. So, um, yeah, him going to Munster, you know, you see people saying Munster needs to start at the 12th position. You know, Jack Crowley is a great ball player if they want to keep their game going that way. But you still need to have someone going forward. And if if Ekito was in the form of his life, he'd be playing at 12 and he'd be going forward for them. So if there's a, a ready-made replacement um, with someone who will definitely go forward and it's part of the Irish setup who will save them a bit of money, um, free up spaces like Bernard has said, um, then it, it's a no-brainer for them. Yeah. Fingers crossed a bit of time apart heals a few of those wounds over the over the next few weeks and they can have a, a good run in because they've plenty of winnable games in the final third of the season in the URC uh Connacht do, but starting off this Saturday they're at home against the Lions. Guys, a couple of bits I want to touch on before we finish up. Obviously, Six Nations starting next week, Ireland and Wales is uh on Saturday, the fourth of February. Johnny, first up, who's wearing number twenty two, Jack Crowley or, or Ross Byrne at the Millennium Stadium? I'll go against my bias here uh, with Jack, but I think Ross Byrne will wear it um, because I think the Millennium Stadium is a is a tough place to go. Andy Farrell has said that during the week. Johnny Sexton will start, but I think, you know, when the pressure comes on at the latter half of that game, I'm not sure it's Jack Crowley's pace that's going to come back into that game. I think it's going to be, and not that he can't control the game, but I think Ross Byrne, proven game winner, um, very controlled, plays with most of those players, you know, within a similar system. I just can't see it not being Ross Byrne, even though I've already said, I think Jack is probably the replacement. If Johnny Sexton doesn't start the game, I think Ross Byrne is the starter for whatever reason. That's just the way I'd be thinking in my own head. Uh, And I think Jack is the replacement. But I think for this one, away in Wales, with the pressure on, with Gatlin back at the helm, with everything that they're going to throw at it, I just have a funny feeling it will be Ross Byrne. Birch, what about yourself? Yeah, I think it'll be Ross Byrne as well. On On the championship in general, there's there's a nice bit of uncertainty into what we're going to have over the next few weeks, like particularly in a World Cup season where we've got two coaches, two new coaches. Okay, granted, Warren Gatlin isn't new per se, but you know it's it's a coaching change year out from World Cup, but it has brought a nice bit of a just unpredictability into what we're going to see, Bernard. Yeah, it is. It's, it's fascinating. I think Portugal will get a a big lift out of out of England straight away with with Sinfield as well, um, and. That's worrying for us. And Wales is fascinating. I mean, there's loads of issues in Wales at the moment. Ospreys obviously have done very well to to qualify, but there's off field issues in terms of budgets. There's um uh sexual harassment cases that if you fall in the world uh, WRU that that could bring down some of the 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 board. Um uh, and you know Gatlin's come into this environment. Okay, he knows it well, but he's not there with. He tried to bring Rob Howdy back in. It was vetoed by the by the WRU, so he's gone for Alex King, obviously who he, he worked with in Wasp, but it's a long time ago. No Sean Edwards, no Robin McBride. Um, you know, the unknown is there. I I I think it's a given that England are going to improve. Um, Wales, we don't know. We we'll find out very quickly. Um, Scotland, I, I presume, will be you know the usual, you know, capable but probably not consistent. And then France, can they now? You know the Galtier squad. He's continued a lot to, of injuries. A yeah, lot. a lot of injuries uh, and and new faces. You know he's 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 managed to get good results um, while increasing his depth uh, to an incredible level. And it still has some new faces in this. Dupont etc. Look look pretty tired. I thought against Munster and, and it was interesting. Hugo Mola spoke about after the match that the um, the load that's on you know those guys. Between international rugby, top fourteen, Champions Cup, and how difficult it is to to keep them fresh, um, and let's be honest, you know, the, the there will be a priority for the World Cup, um, and the French national team. So, but yeah, it's getting that balance right. But 
France obviously are are very dangerous. So it's going to be a a fascinating um Six Nations. Probably with everyone for little eye on the World Cup as well. Probably not as much uh, experimentation, but you'd be hoping that key areas of every, of the Irish game are 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 still functioning really at a really high level. Hmm. I'll put a I'll put a pin in the the Six Nations chat until until next week because I do just briefly want to touch on the the big news in England last week about the the change in tackle laws at the the community level of rugby or below national third tier realistically of England and below. I'm not going to spend too much time on it today because it's I do want to actually kind of do a a proper dedicated podcast on down the line when we have a lot more information about how all of this is going to look because. On the face of it, it certainly looks like it's being considered as an option in Ireland as well to to change the the tackle height uh, to pretty much the waist and below. It has been hugely controversial, Bernard. It's probably the biggest change we've potentially seen in rugby since the, the turn of professionalism. Um, from what you've seen and what you've read about it so far, what would your, your broad thoughts be on it? Uh, I, 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 I can't wait to see the the, the data I know that that is out there, but I need to and to study it. I mean, there's you've had a a bunch of ex pros, uh, kind of going, oh, I would have got concussed more, um, if I if I tackled at, at that level. But then, um, this has been uh, trialed. Uh, a similar a similar rule has been trialed in French rugby, and and the, the reports are that it's been successful. Look at that. We all love oh, sorry, we all love the game as, as it currently is. Um, players, coaches, you know, fans, um, but the reality is there is, uh, you know, something that's a, a big threat to the game, and that's the the whole concussion thing. And and obviously last week we had fifty odd amateur players taking uh, a a lawsuit. So, um, I am not I am not keen to write off or endorse any change until I kind of see how it. You know, folds or, or or read the research of data around it. Um, and I, I'd like to believe it's been driven by 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 hard facts that this is this is safer. Um, so yeah, I, I'd be fascinated to 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 um to listen to a pod. To be honest, on yeah, uh, on the the rights and wrongs or or the thought process behind it. But I look at we just got to try and keep the game safe and um. You know, a friend of mine was in Australia there recently, and, and uh, over 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 the the holidays and at the Christmas, and and you know, a lot of kids aren't playing, uh, rugby there anymore because it's not age, or it's not weight rated like it is in New Zealand, um, and a lot of kids are giving up because smaller kids are giving up the game. So there's lots of different things that world rugby and and the governing bodies have to try and navigate. But for me, I'm willing to, um, I suppose hold my hold my uh, horses on things until I see how it unfolds, and this is just something they're trying, obviously, to. It, it's it's been tried for the right reasons, so um, yeah, I, I'm I'm interested to see how it unfolds. Yeah, and Johnny, I'd probably fall in along those those similar lines as well. Where I think I think we all recognise something kind of has to be done, but even down as far as uh, you know the real amateur level, the real junior level, and I'm speaking from someone who is playing. About as rugby as about as junior rugby as you could possibly get. You know, I play on the the fourth and fifths team in Terenure College. We have lads in our team who are in their early twenties, extending to fellas who are in their fifties. Like it is a pretty wide blanket of age groups that we have in there, and a wide blanket of physiques and abilities and things like that. So, I'm 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 desperately eager to to see how. I think I think what I really want to see is, and I think what where the ORV missed a trick last week is, they didn't show us what it's going to look like, and I think that's what a lot of people are really really concerned about. I would I would be fascinated to see, not just a clip, a twenty second clip of a few phases, but I would love to see how an entire game plays out, and how those tackle heights are policed and the body positions people are having getting into them, uh, just to kind of I think being able to see that. And if that looks like a, a relatively decent product, I think my mind and a lot of other people's minds would be put at ease about it. But the caution then from my side of things is that I would say the majority of tackles I make are probably realistically between the between the the hip and you know that kind of nipple line. And I would say I 
pretty much all of them are 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 bang on. I don't I don't make them all, but I I certainly don't go high on them. You know, they're not they're not illegal, but at the same time, it's I know a lot of people basically who are very very concerned about always putting their heads down below the that hip level, and I think at the real junior levels, you've got a lot of big knees coming up in the air guys who are maybe awkward awkward running styles things like that and it's a huge blanket to put from essentially just below professional level to right down at the amateur grades yeah and like i think people are resistant to change regardless of what change is but i think this is a huge change and like i i think i'm a little bit resistant to change but i'm open-minded in terms of what needs to be done in the game you know so change needs to happen i haven't looked into the research as much as i would like to have done i think we're in the middle of the game block i, I need to keep the uh, the focus on but I do need to look into it because if it's going to happen in our game but like I've seen some I've seen some clips from France and, and you can see that you know the, the offloading game is going to be ridiculous with the fourth and fifths and tearing your I think you're going to get uh, a lot of great offloading uh, opportunities our skill but, level is already off the charts Johnny don't worry about that <laughs> the intention is um, but no it's uh, like it, it'll, it'll, it'll it'll open up a great product if you get it right but like I, I understand uh, the concern because I I think from what I've skimmed over I think the data has been misrepresented in terms of safety with below the the chest line and below the navel and absolutely below the waist I think below the waist was not the top priority in terms of what you'd seen from that uh, that research but I have to again like I said I have to look into it a bit better but I think the concern there is that you know you look at the the Joshua Tuasova kind of into the tackle with a, a crunched kind of position and they're going to outlaw that as well but like you know, it's going to take a long time to change people's habits of kind of bracing for contact. Are you supposed to just run in upright and allow yourself to be tackled and just swing around it and get an offload in? What happens if, like, you know, in the first year, two years, what about those 50-year-olds in the junior team who've been doing that for 30 years, you know, longer? You can't change that habit over the course of a summer of training where contact levels can't be that high anyway. You can't do that much contact in a preseason. So, like, I think there needs to be more of an introduction into, you know, changing the tackle height. I don't think you can just go to waist level Yes, you'll get hips on faces, you'll get knees and faces. I don't think it's the out answer, but I think change had to happen. I would like to see, you know, below the nipple line or something like that. I, I think it's better for the game. I think the change is too big. It's too drastic at all levels, you know. So, yeah, you can go into it a lot more, I think, at a different stage. But I think I think there's some French clips out there. I've seen one or two of them where, you know, you can have a double, double man tackle as well. How does that work when you go into the 22 and you start to pick and go, you know, if I can't be that low and you can't you can't be that high and I can't have a second man in. It's just going to be gain line, gain line, gain line and score. You know, you're not going to be able to stop a guy. So there's there's many, many things that they need to sort out. And I think some um, some tournaments trialing it in our leagues would be better than just changing it outright by next September. Like, Yeah. And as I said, I, I think that's probably why we're we're holding off. We're going to do a, a proper podcast on it down the line because there's just so much kind of grey area at the moment and not a huge amount of clarity on on how the product will look what grades it's going to be coming into, particularly in Ireland, where it's kind of still at very much at the discussion stage. But um, if any players, junior players, things like that, have any thoughts on it or questions they'd like us to to address when we when we do go into a bit more depth on it, feel free to to send us a send us a tweet or a direct message at RT Rugby on Twitter or myself as well, where you'll find me, uh, or send an email into us at RTE. We'll be sure to to flesh those things out because uh, I think we've a long way to go on this as well. But listen, fellas. Thanks a million for joining us, Birch. As always, thanks a million, Johnny. Good luck this weekend. Balna Hinch on Saturday, is it? Balna Hinch at home, so we're at home for a change. Uh, we'd be looking forward to coming home, but yeah, it's a big one at, at the end of this league block, so we're looking forward to it. Where are you this weekend, Birch? We're in Ashburn. Big, uh, big game, four to go. So, um, tough, tough match. Uh, we're top, we're top by five at the moment, but uh, there's Gory, Monkstown, a few other teams breathing down our neck. So, yeah, tough one. And then I'm in. Um, I'm in Belfast Friday. Belfast Friday. Yeah. Pres Bray play. Um, Pres Bray play Black Rock in the cup on Monday. Um, so Danny Brook. Nice easy start, Tizo. So. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, looking no looking draw. Listen, fellas, thanks a million for joining us, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Cheers, guys. Thanks, mate.